to CRISPR ITNC, a genome-wide genetic interaction mapping tool, and my effort in this summer to validate it. So, you know, when I was studying biology, I always found that like biology is really a study of system. A system that is made of mutually dependent subparts. So genes, these genes in our genome are really this kind of like um, subparts that actually interact with each other to form a com uh, to form different complex patterns. So their interactions are crucial for understanding of biology. And that is why we need to map genetic interactions. What is genetic interactions? Um, so like you might just think of as the interaction between genes, but here we are talking about um, the measurement, the pairwise me uh, measurement of how the activity of one gene modulates the phenotype of another gene. So it provides um, a signature of interactions for each gene, which can be used to objectively, objectively identify genes with similar functions. So when we pull out the NCBI annotated genome file, you might see that there is just so many hypothetical proteins. So we can use such tools to identify um, to identify functions for a protein that is unknown of functions. And also, as you can see in this beautiful graph, um, genetic interactions mapping can identify functional relationships between genes that can be harnessed for biological discovery and therapeutic target identification. Um, so to map genetic interactions, researchers have been using gene deletion mutants individually to measure how did the deletion affect other genes, which you know takes a lot of time and is tedious, is costly. So in response to the need of that, in 2009, uh, my dear PI professor, Tim Wendell-Heinen, he developed TNC. Uh, genome-wide tool to identify non-essential genes important for the growth of cells under particular condition, so in a high throughput manner. Um, the idea is to construct a transposal mutant library where transposals are inserted randomly across the genome. But the new thing is to use a restriction enzyme, MFE1, to cut 20 base pair downstream transposal insertion site and sequence the mutant library en masse. So let's know for each individually inserted gene how many mutants survive and grow after a period of time. Um, so like counting the numbers of survived mutants, we can kind of like have this fitness score for each non-essential gene. And the genetic interactions then can be revealed if we modify this experiment and done it in a gene deletion mutants. And so there's actually some limitations about TNC. Um, like when we think about it, only mutants of non-essential genes can survive. Like if there's an essential gene, like such as like one critical in membrane synthesis, like if you insert it into that, well, the cell is gonna die. So TNC can only identify non-essential genes. Well, how about we knock down an essential gene, or namely suppress but not eliminate its expression. And here comes CRISPR I. I'm sure many of us are similar with CRISPR, um, a technique based on bacteria's defense mechanism against virus. Well, CRISPR system has two main components, Cas9 and sgRNA. Uh, well, it is guided to DNA complementary to sgRNA and cut that DNA apart. Well, an analog, analogo of it CRISPR-I or CRISPR interference have a catalytically inactive D-Cas9 protein. So when it binds to DNA, it stays there and stops the transcription elongation. So isn't that a neat way of knocking down a essential gene? So that is how my mentor, Dr. Bimal Jana, proposed a technique he named CRISPR-I TNC. Uh, he constructed the CRISPR-I system um, in streptococcus pneumoniae in order to study genetic interactions. And CRISPR strains carries, um, here you can see, um, carries a lacai repressor here. So like if uh, we can use the 
a sugar called IPDG, an analog of uh, lactose, to actually control the expression of the Cas9. So we can just use different concentration of IPDG to control how is this essential genes not done. And after that, we can construct the TNSIG mutant library from that particular CRISPR I strains and to see their fitness score under absence and presence of IPDG. So that is how you can see this is how we can propose or like map the interactions between an essential gene and non-essential gene. Um, so here is some of the results we obtained in tablet form. So we kind of like obtain the fitness score based on the numbers of mutants survive, and we subtract the fitness score from um, if there's absence of IPG and presence of IPTG. Their difference is the fitness score we're looking for. So in order to validate those scores, which you know propose these interactions among genes, um, here comes my part to actually validate crispr itnc So, well, simply I use gene deletion mutants to verify we construct gene deletion mutants from CRISPR-I CRISPR strain, and the fitness of the gene in absence of presence of IPTG should be similar to the fitness of the transposal mutant library of CRISPR-I strain. So, we utilize homologous recombination that happens naturally for each gene um, by constructing a DNA cassette made of drug marker and YKB upstream and downstream. And we can just delete that genes, ideal, and we can we all sequence the DNA to confirm gene deletion. Uh, we match the growth curve in C plus one media and we compare the results to the uh, interactions score we obtained before. Um, here's just the <laughs> Charlie Black four races of um, upstream, downstream, and the uh, SA, which we all use to confirm the S3 and PCR product. And we use uh, foam phenical oxidotransferase as a drug marker. And as you can see, we sequence the GDNA, confirm there's a deletion. And now we obtain a growth curve by measuring every 30 minutes from uh, when the CRISPR-I uh, CRISPR uh, strain constructed mutants uh, growing from OV 0.03 to the end of exponential phase. So right here. So this is like the part we are considering. And to simply use that time, uh, we just calculate the doubling time by using natural log and we'll yield a score based on the ratio of doubling time and the average doubling time for a well type. Um, so here's four uh, results I obtained. Um, here's one that is uh, PLSX, a non-essential gene, and FabH, a essential gene. So we search for like known genetic interactions, and here we see that um, PLXX and FabH actually have a very strong interactions proposed by other database. And we do the validation. So we can see here the mutant was actually suppressed under like higher concentration. Like here is a suppressed or inhibited growth curve, and here's just the column bar graph of that. So the result actually validated um, our expectation. And we propose, maybe there is some model for it, and we go back to other research and see that both PLSX and FabH is involved in fatty acid synthesis. So here's a model. So if, well, we all know that like in CRISPR-I, uh, FabH, the essential genes were not done here that is responsible for acyl ACP. 
So if SOA-based P was low, actually SO-phosphate can actually complement it. But uh, this is done by PLSX. And we delete PLSX. So this path from SOACP to SO-phosphate is one way. So without PLSX, um, there cannot be regenerated um, a critical component in fatty acid synthesis. So this result confirmed um, our hypothesis. And um, here's another pair. Uh, network analysis gene identified during FAPDSC lockdown showed a cluster of component related genes connected with COMM. And here the result also validated our expectation. And pair three, here you can see also there's a apparent inhibition by IPG. And it is reported that ADK regulates the capsule gene product CPS2D. So ADK interacts with CPS2D, modulates the expression of CPS gene cluster. And we kind of like propose, uh, we go back to the model and see that CPS2D is, CPS2L is responsible for CPS2D protein uh, synthesis. So also this model confirmed uh, our expectation. Here for big thing, <laughs> validation. <laughs> so um, in the future, uh, as, um, since we validated that much of things, we can actually you know like go back to the model and see if those actually those results, the result they gave us actually, uh, if we explore upon the path they will give us the same result. And we can validate some positive interactions. So like negative interactions we'll talk about like in the last four pairs. But positive interactions may also be here when um, it is involved in gene regulation. Um, thank you. <laughs> So you show all those um, scores for each of the genes, right? Mm -hmm. And I may just say it didn't really follow, but like what do you, what do the scores tell you, and mm -hmm. like how do you obtain the score? So uh, you mean uh, the score in validation, right? Um, so there was like a tabular form, and you did that you describe each gene. This gave each gene like a score. Mm. Here. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, like, so this is yeah. the uh, CRISPR ITN sig result. So. Okay. And you also have a set of scores for your validation. Right. 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 Okay. That's so, a different things. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so, here's the idea. So, uh, you know, these are all non-essential genes, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, their score in each. Essential genes, they are in, like essential genes, just CRISPR I uh, control, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we measure the fitness as like in TN6 um, in 20 uh, micromole of IPTG. So, like under this much of IPTG, the essential gene is not done. Um, uh, so, this is like the fitness score. So, if this score is um, Lower it means that there's less mutant survive. Okay. Yeah. So you can see there's the mutant not less mutant survive. And if you compare that with the fitness with no IPG, so like there's no knockdown, but like the uh, the non-essential genes are deleted. So if we compare that, we can like subtractive mm -hmm. and to see hey, it's kind of like this is kind of like a factor involving thing 